Welcome back everyone to us playing TNO, The Last of Europe. I'm your host, Mr. United Kingdom and Andrew Fontaine lover. But we can must continue on with, of course, Andrew Fontaine. Concern from the body to Mr. John Bean, Andrew Fontaine, our new Prime Minister, has taken the bold decision to select you as Chancellor. While you break from previous Chancellors in many ways, I'm sure that your future tenure shall be a unique one. You bring to the Exchequer daring policy proposals to redress economic injustices, the kind that the old guard perhaps unfairly decry as the Socialists. As a former Chancellor learned in economic matters, I can assure you that such fears are unfound and urge you to ignore them with the understanding that they would lash out at any man of common birth above them. I cannot say that while the, the, there are policies that are implement, nonetheless the Prime Minister has selected you who brings new ideas, unsullied by staid formal education, unburdened by our prior experiences and expectations. I'm, I look forward to seeing the results and pray that any concerns I may have are proven wrong. I wish you luck in your future travels, or travails. Although, as you are undoubtedly a man with great understanding of your economic beliefs, you are well aware of what needs to be done and need nothing further from myself. Regards, Rab Butler. It receives a careless scoff and is torn up with surety. The Fountain Cabinet, in the name of His Majesty King Edward VIII, I hereby appoint the following members as the Cabinet of the Government, ran in his name. Cool. Chancellor Exchequer, John Bean, uh, Hilton, uh, anything else? Walter Montague, Douglas Scott. Cool. Uh, look at all these names. Jeffrey Hams, the Minister of Education and Science. Robert Rowe is Minister of Transport. Interesting. Chief of Defense. Chief of Defense Staff. Walter Walker. Da 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 da. Andrew Fontaine. As relied on the torch and dowsing England in oil, the civil service is by no means an institution, which is any way amenable to fascism. <clears throat> it has always been a hive of pragmatists, weak and cowardly men who worked their new orders solely to avoid having their lives snuffed out in some cases, to emerge in levels of corruption and decadence more reminiscent of the 20s than the 60s. Fortunately, this cowardice is very useful to us. Just as these men grew to their teeth and choked down whatever orders the garrison sent them, they will do likewise for us, and if they don't, the blacks will remind them of their advantages of loyalty. But I do want to read about Andrew Fontaine. The vision of a <clears throat> Britain for us has been reborn, no longer in the form of the antiquated, dusty politics held by old men as has-beens, but under the banner of the young and the new. And at the head of the banner is none other than Andrew Fontaine, born into an aristocratic bloodline, Fontaine was always inclined towards reactionary politics, an inclination that drove him to fight under Franco's banner during the Spanish Civil War. It was there that he saw a glimpse of the might of the Reich's war machine in action. When Britain marched to war against, Ber against Berlin over Danzig, he did his duty and joined the Royal Navy, but as the Empire was shattered and the swastika rose across Europe, Fountain took the choice no patriot would ever wish to. He turned against his family, nation, and duty, laying down his arms to the Reich with an area of protest. As a prominent landowner and one of the earliest collaborators, Fountain rapidly rose through the ranks of the British People's Party while it seemed that his pu public disputes with Chesterton may have doomed his career, Chesterton's failure only propelled him onwards to the office of Home Secretary. It's repeated when the rebellion spurred on by night. Treated that he was left a vacuum of power, one that Fountaine seized with no hesitance. The resistance lies defeated, and with their democracy-loving friends next in line to the gallows as a truly fascist Britain begins to take shape. As the shadows of fascism cast across the aisles, Fountaine's vision can finally come true. Britain lives and marches on. The Great Orchestra. The PPP tel campaign office was abuzz with noise. The sounds of ringing telephones, rustling papers, and rapid conversation nearly drowning out all else. Office workers ran from room to room, passing notes and messages, while black shirts and temporary workers rushed around the office bearing posters, leaflets, and flyers, while artists sketched design after design. The office was so chaotic it seemed almost impossible to coordinate, impossible for all except the conductor at its center. No overlooking a poster design with a disapproving expression. Not this one, said John Bean, pushing the concept paper away in disappointment, too repetitive and far too generic. The point is to focus on today's issues, not an uprising already crushed. He pointed to as a half soldier on the right of the poster, marching hand in hand with the British one, this goes for all of you, less soldiers and everything. Our purpose here is to offer an alternative to Bolshevism, so focus on the worker, not the soldier. He stopped off muttering to himself. Distribution was equally frustrating. As protection, he scolded, speaking carefully to the blackshirt commanders as though to very slow children, it's simple. The paid workers put up posters and you protect them. We want local communities involved in distribution, not outsiders marching in. The commanders glowered at him, clearly resenting his authority. All the same, he knew they would obey. He dismissed them with a snap of his fingers. Go on now. Get your people in line. Broadcasting for its part fared much better than the design and distribution. In a number of rooms, radio personalities stood before microphones for setting lines. It had been Bean's own idea to massively expand upon the BPP's presence on the airwaves. Television would mostly reach upper-class families and posters, while a start were not enough. A combined constant presence of posters and radio, though, was a step in the right direction. So long as Britain's workers saw their messages everywhere, Bean knew it would be inevitably sank in. The conductor waves its arms, and the flames climb ever higher. Ignite the aisles. The fuel is doused, and the torch burns brightly. Now the cleansing fire will purify Britannia of the rot that has been allowed to fester in her for too far too long. And if it's just a tool for it, the National Purity Act will ignite the infernal that reforged Britannia. Anti-British materials will be scoured from this nation. Let the books be burnt. The films destroyed, the statues shattered. Every tech on the screen nation will be destroyed. No ifs, buts, or about it. Britannia's honor will be protected. Let the mewling scum cower before a my we will burn them away, and their legacy shall be consigned to ashes, broken before the new pure Britain. Hatred from the soul. 
Dear Mr. Jeffrey Hamm, it is a tradition for ministers to leave parting letters to the successors and offer advice from their own tenure in office. Perhaps Fountaine, even a sure respect for tradition remains within him, is writing a letter to his own successor. For my part, I have no advice to offer to you. You and your elk have no interest in good governance, and I will not insult myself by assuming otherwise. You are a jumped up a little thug, full of cunning but little higher intellect. You and Fountaine surround yourselves with an ill tempered band of brutes and dreamers, totally avoid of the refinement of dignity or dignity this position deserves. What do you have to offer the moral and intellectual development of Britain? What do you and Fountaine even know of governance beyond whatever you shout and carry on in about every town square you visit? Nothing, I think. Know that we shall not stand for anything further perversion of our spirit. If you want to follow your idol into the grave, that is your business. But I and the old guard will not let you drag England along with you. Do not write or phone me. You would not listen anyway. Sincerely, Jane Birdwood, Baroness Birdwood. This is a petty little remark and deposit it into the nearest bin. Well, honestly, I don't really care. Oh, you go Banzer, sees Paris Santa Cruz. Because I'm sure the same thing politics apply all over the world, including good old United States of America. Christmas offensive, huh? Fear from the heart, dear Mr. Huxley Blythe. I first recall a meeting at BBB conference in 1957, in that horrible little hotel in Blackpool. Most of my colleagues preferred the meeting indoors, but you preferred to go to the streets meeting and speaking to as many people as you could. That, I suppose, is one of your greatest strengths. But as you spoke out against Bolshevik influence to a crowd of shopkeepers and artisans, I can help but remember that perhaps 50 kilometers east was the city of Manchester, where Jack Jones would fire his first shots three years later. Manchester is a working man city. It was the alienation of the working man that sparked the fires which twice lit the city aflame. Those were frustrations which went, went unheeded by government for so long that drove them into the hands of the Bolsheviks. No amount of leeches or rhetoric can fill a man's stomach and keep him warm through the winter. If there's any lesson I can impart to you, let it be this. The government cannot afford to speak over the problems of labor any longer. Though our previous government was divided and slow to act when it mattered, it's now your responsibility in a more united government to address these problems. Listen to the workers, hear the concerns, and do your utmost best to meet them. Our failure to address their needs caused two uprisings. I fear that we may not survive a third. Take care. Harold Wilson. She has a cautious smirk, though doubt creeps up alongside the back of his neck. A truly fascist budget. Now that the uprising is over, Prime Minister, the principal goal of all of our economic planning must be self-reliance. We have been relying on Germany for too long and for too much, and our workers suffer because of it. Therefore, I propose a devaluation of the pound in order to reduce the trade imbalance with Germany. However, I would also propose that we keep these price controls in place. I understand that they are originally intended to be a wartime measure, but they seem to be, to me, an excellent way to damage speculation and banking interests. We also need to expand our farming subsidies in order to begin easing the rationing and gain a more self-reliant agrarian economy. I would suggest incentivizing the purchase power or the purchase of new equipment and fertilizers by farmers who have greater subsidies to those who do. Fountain, with little to no economic knowledge, was simply listening to Bean's plans and nodding in agreement. It all sounded rather sensible to him, and it seemed as though he knew what he was doing. Bean himself couldn't uh, be more pleased at how the meeting was going. He had been called there to prepare the budget, and Fountain seemed likely to accept all his proposals. Continuing, Bean said, We also need to prepare the ground to fully transition to a corporatist workers' economy as such. I also suggest the foundation of corporate bodies to give uh, government manufacturing, farming, and forestry. The expansion of those bodies and the creation of them for other industries are our principal economic goal for the future. Battle plans tend not to survive contact with the enemy. Loyalty is mandatory. Now let me be clear. We're not here to horse uh, trade or to coax you into following our orders. The Prime Minister sets policy and the civil service execute it to the best of their ability. The only reason this meeting was called is at all because we have already begun to notice a discussing, perhaps even treacherous, lack of loyalty when it comes to enforcing the most basic edicts of the government. Fontaine had been carrying on in, in this vein for quite some time, and the sen senior most undersecretaries and heads of the emergency services were watching with a mixture of concealed dread and resentment. He then paused along whatever responses they could make to his, to his rant. One of the braver undersecretaries said, Well, we've just survived a major uprising, sir, and capabilities are strained as they are. How can we expect to implement your policies when we can barely administer the country as it is? Fontaine had been expecting, perhaps even hoping for this response, and immediately began his own. The reason that this administration is weak and incapable is due to a lack of fascist policy, and its capabilities would never improve without implementation. I know as well as you do that there are very few men in this room who consider themselves fascists, and that does not matter. You open my policy in just the way I want it, with the zeal of any blackshirt or He even nodded Jeffrey Hamm, the blackshirt commander who had been previously observing the meeting quietly. Hamm was a far more brutal, less refined public speaker than Fountaine. But what did not matter was for his plan message. Let me be sure and blunt, gentlemen, I already know where most of you live, and my blackshirts will find out the locations of who, those who don't. Well, those who don't know where they live. You'll follow my orders or pay. The civil servants will comply, whether it be through loyalty or through fear. Well, if the civil, civil service doesn't work. You don't have to fight them. Get rid of them. Replace them. That's all you have to do. Fanning the flames, the old order has been cast into the roaring infernal fascism to scour away the impure and the corrupt and the decadent. We cannot rely on the fire alone to continue to burn. Someone must fuel the fuel and someone must must man the bellows. And who better to fulfill the twin test than John Bean and Jeffrey Hamm? The Hamm will pass the bellows. He will scour the corrupt, the weak, the liberals, and the remaining Judeo Bolsheviks from Britannia's fair shores. He will crush all the threats to our campaign and from the purity of the flame will make a new Britain, Britain free of the impure. To be will come the duty of feeding the flames, to make this fire once strong enough to set all Britain alight. It will rouse the nations once willing the ranks of the BPP into a national force crushing all before us. Where Ham will destroy the rust, Bean will grow the steel, all for a greater Britain, the captain alone. 
When Andrew Fountain's car pulled into his childhood home at Nar Ford Hall, he expected to feel something like triumph, a little like conquering hero or returning home after all. Britain was all his now. No more simpering, yes, Prime Minister, at relics like Dom Villanelle came. No more hand wringing and whining from that resistance rat loving butler about injustice about every time he stupidly breathed. With them gone and out of the way, even he had an even bigger challenge ahead. An entire country that needed a real strong fascist vision, one that would need to be rebuffed from the ground up. One moment of weakness or failure, and he could go the way of Chesterton. What is it, dear? asked Rosemary. He turned away from her and looked out of the window, absentmindedly drumming his fingers on the side. It's nothing. Now well, the staff started making breakfast, would you? It's been a long drive. He could feel her frowning at the change of subject, even without seeing her. I'll go tell them. John asked if he might visit while we're here, by the way. She got out of the car and he followed, waving his greeting to the staff at the door before striding upstairs to his study. The staff had kept in good condition, he noticed. Everything was just as he left it, down in the portrait of his father in the vice admiral's uniform. He wondered if his father ever felt half so lost at sea as Andrew Fontaine felt right now. He'd always been a speaker and a doer. He felt at home at rally. At a rally or working in the home office to real enemies. Ideological visionary screeds and plans for the future of shaping Britain were the kind of thing he left to John, or to him. He needed their advice in the coming days if the great fascist revolution were uh, going to prove any more successful and coherent than the old man who preceded them. The ship of state would need reliable men to crew her, or ship her. Or a leader. Pretty much. England led and marches on. Every man had his element where he felt most comfortable, and for Andrew Fontaine, that was. If we have a camera behind a microphone, the sheer invigorating power of being able to whip men into a frenzy or inspire them to root out degeneracy with just a word was intoxicating. He could barely keep his smile off his face as the camera was wheeled before his desk, taking a deep cup of water. He sat down, nodded to the camera crew, and looked straight into the lens. Good morning, people of Britain. I am speaking to you now, not as your prime minister, but as a Briton who loves the country. For decades, you've been threatened by uprisings, terrorists, Jews, and communists. We live in a period where you've been bombed, terrorized, shot at. No more. Hand in hand with the European brothers, we'll march forward in a new glorious future, a fascist future, free to generous and terror. When the history of our island is written, they'll speak of today as the first day of a new dawn. The fascist revolution begins today. Countless ears would hear Fontaine's words broadcasted through every television in Britain. Fount uh, black shirts cheered the pronouncement from the barracks, saluting the television with utter zeal. Fontaine's MPs toasted. And spoke of new times coming, of a great new revolution long overdue. The near leaderless former pragmatist MPs watched with their screens in horror, unable to look away. For those less connected to the Byzantine world of Whitehall politics, the broadcast drew a more mixed response. Some remembered of how at least the government was now taking action, even if the Home Secretary turned Prime Minister. It seemed a little intense. Others murmured fearfully what the word revolution might mean, gesturing at the ever larger masses of black shirts and propaganda in the streets. The few now British li still living in Britain were more frightened, still wondering just whether the Fountain might cast his gaze on the next. Whatever they felt, one thing was certain. All of Britain would fell, feel Fountain's will. And blue sky thinking. Peter paced around the length of Andrew Fountain's office as he signed off on tonight's final work. Most reports requiring his attention involved the growing rivalry between him and Bean. Every day, one or the other received a new source of support, and Fontaine had trouble trying to keep up with who was his favorite in the office. He felt claws in his legs and let out a slight yelp of panic. Peter had crawled up his leg, thinking the best spot for a nap was the Prime Minister's lap. Bloody cat, he muttered. His hands reached out to grab the Chief Mouse Stewart, but stopped mid flight. An idea formed in the Prime Minister's head. Silly, yes, but alone in the office, no one would know and think less of him for indulging in it. With Peter perched on his lap, Fountain pulled out some of the old photographs from files on his desk. He found a less than flattering one of Ham in his old black shirt, arm raised and shouting at some past rally. Beans was far less dynamic, a mere front-facing portrait in which he wore a somewhat gormless smile. Clearly. Clearing some space at the end of his desk, he set these two photographs at equal distance from each other, their faces towards Fountain and his newest advisor. Come on, girl, said Fountain, which one do you like the most? Oh, that's interesting. Uh, Peter's eyes flicked between the two portraits, Fountain, and watched the trajectory of her head with curiosity and trepidation. He could not see her face directly, but in his mind's eye conjured, conjured a facial expression which read as pensive as thought in a cat and projected it onto Peter as her head swiveled between the two photos. And then she turned around, left off the desk and wandered to the door. Fountain could not help but chuckle. He got up and opened the door, letting up the chief monsieur to return to her duty, of course. Uh, funding, he dared not to recount this tale to anybody, lest they think he was mad or desperate. Revolution from below. John Bean is doubtlessly one of the most skilled men within the PPP. A man Fountain himself holds a great deal of trust in. He's been a core pillar of our movement from almost the very beginning, and now, as we advance in securing our control over the sceptered isle, a skill in securing that population support, as well as a political operator, will be vital in maintaining our power base and the government. As such, it only makes sense to grant him a promotion. He will be appointed as chairman of the people, British People's Party, where skills can be put to good use. He will scour away the rot that has corrupted this glorious party, and the revolution continue in earnest. 
But unfortunately, the BBB, modern British fascism, has been flawed for many years. It's stuck in the past. The ideals and principles of the party were birthed in the aftermath of the Great War. It is stuck in the past with the Duke of Bedford and uh, David Lloyd George. These are figures that died over decades ago. We need change now. Despite its problems, the British People's Party has always had it at its heart the right place. John Bean presents a promising solution. Reforming our nation's party to fit the modern standard for our fascism. Germany's NSDAP, Italy's PNF, Hungary's EP. For the sake of the future generations, we must change. Daggers in the sheath. You know, gentlemen, I've been meaning to have this meeting for a while now. But we should have had it. It's been sitting here weeks ago. Fountain had the energy and impatience within him to bark at the two men for hours. He wouldn't. His throat would be sore for the rest of the weekend as he had several speeches to perform. It was any week to not kill his voice for it would be this one. This, I don't even know what to call it. Power building between you two, it's a sign of weakness to the entire world. You are lucky none of your screaming matches have leaked to either the Reich or Heck, even the Judeo Bolshevik infiltrators. So, ring a muck here. Germany's here, is of any of this? The revolution will be a homicide case and the blood will be on your hands. And to be completely honest, we shouldn't be sitting here in the first place. We are here to help Britain embrace a revolution, the likes of which the world has not seen in decades. Nobody in our ministry needs this petty squabbling between you two when we have a job to do. Jeffrey Ham, going to sit her back with his hand. Despite all that Bolshevik and capitalistic nonsense that Bean might have been throwing at the Prime Minister, the revolution must be standing united. And Germany, God, if they ever had found out, every member of the British People's Party would ever find their head in a noose and all because of a vulgar argument between two ministers would surely try them all for treason. To be completely honest, he would have a fair reason to do so. John Bean scratched his cheek. Cam, with all his flaws, was a very simple and blunt man. At this point, anyone would have to accept it, yet Bean had him. It was clear that the man was very narrow-minded, and he would also have to accept that. The revolution's implementation is more important than anything else, and he would have to compromise to achieve victory in Britain. Are we ready, gentlemen? Both ministers shook their heads in agreement. Uh, <laughs> Fontaine stressed clear as this was possible, possibly the shortest meeting a prime minister could ever hope for, only to be unsheathed when provoked, as we need to refer to the BBB, but enslaved to the future. Uh, Net of unity. By the time we, they returned to the manor, they were wearing the false smiles again. Oh. Okay. Uh, Ian Foster strolled with many of his co workers along the cracked brick walkway. Adjusting his fiddler's cap, something caught his eye as he turned in the corner. Why should he have been surprised? Nothing but the usual post remark by the infamous flash and circle that adorned anything the Fountain Ministry would publish. Bolded letters encapsulated the outline of the piece. The common man works for our future. Why not work towards a better one? Work for the glory of Britain and the work for the fascist revolution. He had scoffed at the idea of the poster. Why in God's name would any worker with an ounce of common sense want to work with this Nazi collaborative government? His notion that any worker would be interested and affected by this propaganda nauseated him. He would look over to some of his colleagues only to see the blank expressions he knew them. Well enough that most of these men were uh, mentally blocking the propaganda from their minds, something that Ian could never do. However, horror soon filled his eyes as he looked further in the back. Younger workers butted his shoulders and pointed at the posters. Ian looked in their eyes. These interactions weren't that point in the left type. These young boys, not knowing any better, were intrigued by this. The eyes of almost all of them had a certain shine to them, which to Ian was enough to ruin his day. Eyes turn forward. Don't think about it. These posters wouldn't affect that many. There's only one. Surely there isn't more. You should have known better. The posters, and mostly the same one that at that. Line the walls for the entire way down to the factory you labored for. The steel oil door even had a man rolling the poster up as he arrived. Better days ahead, you say, huh? We're Britain. With the further consolidation of our influence across country, or nation, we can at last implement a long-term ambition for a movement. Mandatory BBB membership. Slowly but steadily, this shall be implemented across the country, replicating the success of the PNF's own plan in Italy. Starting in the government itself, we'll work to make sure all those who serve in His Majesty's government are a member of the British People's Party. From this, we shall slowly spread outwards. One man every day, every one day, every man, woman, and child will be a devout member of a party, a participant in the great fascist revival. We are the nation, and the nation is us. Last man standing. For a man so used to wearing masks like as Kim Philby, blending into a crowd was like second nature. Not a single one of the small restaurant occupants so much as gave him a second look, and why would they do? To them, the MI5 director was just another middle-aged man enjoying his morning paper. He liked the spot, even though it was far from the Leckenfield house in his office. It was quiet and out of the way, and more importantly, the owners were apathetic and didn't pay a second glance to the regulars. Full breakfast? He gave the rushed-looking waitress a polite, a polite smile. That'll be me, thank you. She nodded, sitting down to play with eggs, toast, and sausage before scurrying off to another table. The eggs weren't bad. Although the sausages were a bit dry, the food was, wasn't as good as old favorite spot, but after he'd visited the place with the night plenty of times, it seemed suicidally stupid to return out now. Hard to come back considering he'd been sitting in there with a man who'd been the most wanted man in Britain until recently. He missed the old spy master and his little eccentricities, like this pie for that bird collection he was so proud of. It was darkly funny that a man who in another time would have been an arch reactionary hunting Phil before socialism would become one of the closest things he had to a friend. Now was gone now, along with Jonas, McLean, Alexander, and Sterling, all dead, and along with every mole they'd painstakingly planted in MI5 over the years. For the first time, Kim Phil was truly completely utterly alone. A single man alone, now surrounded by some of the worst fascist vipers Britain had to offer. It made no difference. He stood with a grim determination, pulled on his coat, and slipped a few cash notes underneath the plate. Although or not, this was his uh, fight. It would always be his fight. Ah. We are Britain, and true champions of the worker. 
The working class is a gear. It turns history along, driving nations forward. Britain was made great off the backs of the British workers, and they were betrayed. The columns claim that they were the champions of the workers when they pitted them against their nation for the sake of destroying Britain for the sake of their international revolution. The liberals were too thought that they were uh, champions of the workers, promoting foolish ideals like democracy. There's always one group that truly fights for the workers, and without always will without any further lies. Fascism is good, honest flame of liberation that will secure Britain's workers the rights and glory that they've earned. If we are to truly reforge Britain, we must convince the workers of this. So made to cry, this is Bolshevism, but we all know our own. And we shall reward them. Listen from Fast, he's fast. John Bean stared down at the pile of torn out newspaper pages, worn out books, and the rare intelligence reports that they could glean from the continent. They're all about European fascism and the many forms it took, but each and every one of them told him the exact same story division, infighting, and uh, squabbling were the pettiest reasons, and when their central authority collapsed, who too did their regime. For a system that had won the Second World War, the decline had set in quickly. Flicking his eyes to one of the newspapers, uh, newspapers reporting on the crises in Eastern Europe was enough to reinforce that for Bean. Something was rotting in the system. It was an artificial unity of their leaders that was removed it was removed, it all went to hell. As Bean rose from his pen, Rose's pen, to take another note, he glanced out of the window over London's dark and dreary streets. Uh, the fallout of the uprising was visible everywhere, an uprising that had been caused by more than the sudden absence of Germany. No, it was much more than that. Brushing the stacks of paper aside, Bean stared out an old diagram of the organization of the NSDAP. All power flowed down from the Führer to the nation, the same applied with the PNW, PN, PNF. All power flowing from the Duce. Bean paused before grabbing a transcript of the old announcement of surrender. Flipping it over, he began to sketch something out. Power depriving from the nation a bottom up of national development. A new fascism. A new light to shine from Europe. A new model for the world. Bean rose from his seat and walked over to the window. Britain went to return to her rightful place in the world as a vanguard, a leader, and an exemplar for the world. A new fire burns. A breakfast quarrel. In the early morning, Hammond Bean would wake up to an invitation by the Prime Minister for breakfast in his office. A slice of golden brown toast coated in a layer of juicy poached eggs, a savory chicken, gravy glazed and trimmings of to roasted chicken across the rim of the toast. You're joking, right? Both suddenly chuckled to themselves. This had to be a trick. The Prime Minister had never been such a kind man towards the two in his life. Something was off. However, the two kids, like two kids at a candy show, they could not help themselves. Bean, still swallowing his last piece of toast, interrupted the small talk that introduced any political meetings. Gentlemen, gentlemen, that me meal surely was stupendous. Uh, thank you, Prime Minister, but I think it's time we stop this chatter and get on to tr some truly important matters. Fontaine, placing his dish to the side of his desk, focused his attention on Bean. Brushing the crumbs of his black tuxedo, Bean would begin, Thank you, Prime Minister. I've had plans for a small bit now for a possible route for a meal industry that would, be e that would appeal to the working class. Hamill spat his cup of tea all over the hardwood table. Are you insane? Are you seriously trying to present this, this Judeo-Bolshevik nonsense to the Prime Minister? Hamill almost laughed, but he held back trying to avoid choking on his own spit. Bean felt a familiar headache return. It seems uh, to always appear whenever Hamill entered the room. Coming from the man who's been nothing but a jumped, up jump thug waiting to prey on innocent people his entire life, I would hardly expect you to understand. Both the men stood up from the table with their eyes gazing straight through each other. Fountain rose as well, only shouting, Both of you calm down, clean yourselves up, and I want you out. Jeffrey sat back down. John has always had intriguing ideas. Let him hear him out. A concept done right. The Duchess Abbott's front was perhaps one of the greatest developments of the Reich. A national union, merging the power of the worker and the nation to seem as whole. No longer will the petty divides of class split the nation between the labor and director. The nation strikes as one against the chains of global finance, capital, and Judeo-Bolshevism. What a sad ruin has become. Once it was a tool for the workers, and now, well, it's a petty tool of mega corporations to exploit the German worker for their own profits. And their own slavery to finance capital. Well, that may have happened in Germany, but it will not happen in Britannia. The new British Workers' Alliance will be a voice for the true workers of Britain. Only united Britain will Britain live, and, and it is a singular front will march to claim our rightful place in the future and discard away all before us. Who's leading Germany right now? Oh, Schperr. Schperr again. Oh, go figure. Drunken politics. Brandon, Leo, and Chase chattered about their arrogant boss as they entered the pub. Brandon entered with that fast arse hot at the top has tried to get rid of me several times. Second times agreed with him, but, you know, I need it to help my family, so I keep coming back. Chase laughed while Leo acknowledged with, yeah, I really do not like that guy. Tried to taking me away, too, from... The bartender interrupted, asking for their drink of choice. Brandon, a glass of gold, gold wasser. Leo, a glass of Bernjäger. And Chase, a whiskey cocktail. Leo was annoyed by this, but kept going where he was going with before. Yeah, what I was trying to say was uh, our boss tried taking me away from my political independence with that forced PPP membership. Can't believe him. Brandon responded with a hint of a question in his voice. What do you mean by that? Tried taking away my political independence? Leo turned back with shock. I thought you guys already knew. I'm resigning from the company. I don't want to join a party that lied like that. A uh, criminal. His friend barked back, are you kidding, right? You dare call our leader a criminal and you quit your job over it? Leo's impression quickly sat his friend's loyalty immediately became clear. Wait, 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 when in the heck did you become a supporter of Fontaine? Do you not know your place? He's revitalizing the economy, bringing in more jobs. Do you want people who want to be jobless? Chase whisk, sipped his whiskey. A smooth this out, smooth the situation for him. Why do my friends have to fight right now? Or such a silly little subject? Uh, it's not even like they're wise or cheating on each other, but politics? He suddenly wondered whether this is what the Germans felt like back in 1933. Attendance of an inferno. Zero without direction is useless, and a revolution without purpose and vision from above is nothing but an unruly animal mob. The PPP of 
old it would have been utterly unfit to provide such a vision, filled as it was with doddering old men and traitors. Through the magnificent efforts of John Bean, the holdout pragmatist members had grown smaller and smaller by the days, replaced by the true fascists with hearts kindled by furious fervor. When the party made so low, we consider uh, the internal powers of the BPP around the chairman himself. Patty bickering and fearful whimpering will become a thing of the past. The Prime Minister will let the spark of change, and Bean's chosen attendants shall faithfully fan the flames into an inferno. That would be great. Hey, let's end the South African War. Exit from the, jewel, the Journal of Ian Foster's. Fountain and his Chancellor John Bean formed the British Workers' Alliance only last night. Oh, wow, they actually did that well. First time I heard of this was in the morning. Make papers this morning. Uh, it was a bit of a weird, rough awakening on my part, never expecting anything from Fountain. They said to be there at 7 o'clock at night. And hopefully around 750,000 others would be there to accompany you. Unlike most of the things, they were not lying. The crowd was packed, and I mean packed. It was surely over the estimated number the government gave. Heck, I even had a hard time packing, parking my BMW. Mine was small, and even with that, I couldn't find a good spot. I was surprised when I saw the flame that burned in the Union leader's eyes. I think it was something like Ted Budden. There is something special behind them. Personally, I was expecting some 70-year-old man that could barely spit out a sentence, but no, he was flailing his arms all around trying to punctuate the words with them. And that beaming smile didn't see nothing like it. The massive way people somehow respected the guy, too. I guess Bean is doing some real work to reel these people in. And to say the least, it showed. There were some posters everywhere in the surrounding uh, Budden's podium. The wall behind him had a massive flashing circle, which was also on the podium itself, if I remember correctly. With the blokes flamboyant energy and the massive amount of BPP imagery, you could say it was a rally and you wouldn't be too far off. Budden was also throwing insults at the other workers somehow without being rep reprimanded for it. He said some things that were caveats to being in role within the program, and if those are broken, that all of us would be powerless. And again, do not expect anything from Fontaine. At this point, it just seems like my job as a factory worker has been used as a tool for the state to bully its enemies out of relevance. I go to work almost every day of the week to give myself and hopefully down the line my uh, my relative stability, but now what? I go to work almost every day to serve my country. I'm not a soldier, and under this government, I refuse to be. He even places his pen to the side of his desk, put the general underneath his dresser, and slammed himself against his bed. Tomorrow's another day. Let's get some rest. Moses Trenchant. The uprising has revealed the festering rot in British society for all to see, and it's a rot that must be uh, eliminated without mercy. Thankfully, the torch lit by Oswald Mosley decades ago was carried on by Geoffrey Hamm. He's man most suited enforcing a rip. A proud soldier of the fascist cause and afraid of dirtying his hands for the greater good. We should let slip ham and the black shirts their mission to hunt down and investigate all of subversive elements. Their dogged pursuit of these indigenous and saboteurs will strike fear into the hearts of any who dare to even follow to think to follow in night's footsteps. To burn away the old. Arthur stared over the roaring mess of the Norfolk branch meeting of the MP BPP had become, as the booming echo of God Save the King echoed throughout the old church that had been secured for the meeting. Arthur knew very well it would be the most unified this meeting would ever get. A brief cough came from Arnold on his left as the singing came to an end, and Ar Arthur rose to his feet. Gentlemen, to the king, to the flag, and to the nation, he said. The rest followed in unison with him before sitting down again. Staring over the hall, Arthur could sense that there, would be, there was a visible tension in the air. Like at any second, something that would break. Still, that was chair of the local branch. It was his job to advance the meeting, clearing his story began to speak. Now, welcome, gentlemen. You should know that the agenda for today by now, and as such, we'll move on to the first motion of the day. Traitor, a voice suddenly roared from the crowd. We've all seen Lennon's orders. Every branch of leadership must be voted on. Arthur froze. The only reason he was here is because of the recent orders forcing him into the party. If he had his way, just be a clerk. We have a duty to our nation to maintain the purity of the party. I called us order a meeting with a motion to remove the chair from the position. All in favor? And one by one, hands rose from all across the hall, all of them from the young, new members of the party. Motion carried. Arm of the party, arm of the state. Great revolutions cannot be built on words and rhetoric alone. They require a vanguard of valiant knights, willing to march to battle. Since Cable Street, the Blackshirts have strolled from battlefield to a battlefield in defense of a revision bearing a lot of the torch of fascism. Even with its faithful service, the Blackshirts have been forced for decades to endure a murky, ill-defined status without formal legal powers, fearful of their zeal. The cowards of the pragmatists and old garb incessantly dodged the question of their formal position whenever raised. With never tend not firmly in our grasp, we can finally declare the Blackshirts a direct arm of the state, empowering, empowered to bring fire and sword to our enemies. Our fierce champions shall ride forth, and all Britannia shall know them as our fist. Well, it cannot, what's done cannot be undone. A synchronized thud of hundreds, of now thousands of footsteps was akin to a drum signaling the arrival of the black shirts. Legions of men coasted the lawn of Parliament Square as if some great oil slick had been spilt. Scattered among these fanatics was a police officer who, uh, officially speaking, was there to maintain public order, although in reality it was to protect the public from their excesses. Suddenly, all inquires the man of the hour arrived to deliver a speech. Jeffrey Hamm marched to the podium. Clearing so it is a privilege for me to speak to so many of you here today, he began. To be surrounded by so many great men who insisted, instead of asking what they can take from the country, instead ask themselves what they could give. It fills me with such pride, truly. For you men have sacrificed so much to carry the torch of British civilization. With this torch, we shall set alight all those who seek to corrupt the soul of our great people. With the first line of defense against degeneracy, let us today proudly rejoice in the being the vanguard of fascism. A deafening cheer erupted from the crowd as almost everyone was swept up in Ham's words, all save for one. 
The police officer felt a cold sweat descend upon him. As Sam spoke, it was like watching a car crash in slow motion. Those slugs were going to get to many, many innocent people killed. There was nothing he could do about it. The moment of opportunity had long since passed when the uprising was put down. The men's conscience aided him for it not to affect him to him when he had the chance, but now all he could do was watch the oncoming crash. Was it a cowardice that I dare not defect? Up by St. Jordan. The British Free Corps, though we are united in our crusade to create a stronger Britain than this band of hoodlums, and psychopaths have been our rivals since the very beginning. The quasi leader Colin Jordan represents a very diverse Britain. He is an unintelligent brute who worships of uh, 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 verges on insanity, and his father's maniacal uh, zealotry makes even the most fanatical of our supporters wary. It's clear something must be done to stop them, and though curtailing their operations and having their lower black church take place, we can help them weaken Jordan's influence within the country and with Germany. We can help them buy time to find a more conclusive resolution to the problem of their existence in the future, but for now we can rest easier knowing that they have been neutered. For a safe and secure society. The House of Commons lay quiet at the tomb, the only interruption the occasional cough. Every PPP MP's eyes lay fixed upon the speaker, awaiting the man's words. The independence for the part seemed more focused on the imposing set of Geoffrey Hamm and several of his men standing near the exit. Not a single man had dared to ask the reason for their presence at the proceeding, and none of the five seemed to be volunteering for an answer. The speaker cleared his throat. Honor members of Parliament, the Secretary of State for Justice has a floor. Please save all discussion until the secretary has concluded reading out of his proposal. The minister nearly jumped in eagerness to Sam. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Gentlemen, without the valiant service of the Black Shirts, how many would have you been strung up or shot by some would-be partisan? To ensure continued protection, and that of all Britain, the Security Service Reform Enforcement Act will incorporate the Black Shirts as a formal security service uh, akin to the British Free Corps with all legal powers associated. <coughs> A roar of cheers from the BPP members met with the declaration, while the independents sat uh, silently fear unwilling to say a word. If there's no opposing points of discussion, said the Speaker, we will proceed to. This is an abomination, cried an independent, lurching to his feet defiantly. Be silent, bellowed an MPP, a BPP MP in response, but the man shook his head, refusing to be cowed. Andrew Fontaine claims to have loved Britain, yet he would deliver her into the hands of men who, is scarcely better, who are scarcely better than the traitors. How can any of you any of you vote for such a bill in good conscience, knowing what these, I want to call them men in Cornwall did, in Edinburgh? These butchers have no place in a government or in any other. He looked around, despairing, sinking into a seat, defeating, defeat when defeated when no eye would meet his. Fifteen minutes later, the speaker announced that they eyes had carried the bell to a new chorus of cheers from the BPP. Andrew Fontaine said nothing, choosing instead to give Ham a single pointed glance. The next day, a certain MP was nowhere to be found. Telling up the sentence. To say that our ministry was the nation's favor to rise to the position would be lying to millions. Many of the party still support reaction or ambassador to fascist movements, including the recessive leadership of Chesterton and Donville. Some. Uh, even still supporting the attempted monarchist uh, wallop. They don't understand a movement until we gained our leadership. They seemed to us that they do not understand quite yet, and would continue the reactionaries if given the chance. The fifth column must be crushed. Lest orthodox fascism be smothered into history. Good. A thug by other, any other name. The day was a pretty one with sunlight, seeping through the wide bakery windows to bathe the shop and raise the gold. Between the weather, the scent of fresh made sausage rolls and the pot of hot, pot, hot tea. A Graham had put on for himself, it was finally seemed as though things were going all right. Ever since that horrible autumn day when the uprising had begun, he dreaded the day war would come to the peoples. For months, the war had raged until at last Himmler withdrew and he had allowed himself to hope things had been over. Then the BFC came. It was over. Graham reminded himself, his hands shaking as he had the oven door open to pull out a tray. After a terrifying, terrifying month, full month of BFC patrols, they left as soon as they come, leaving chair and broken bones in the wake. Everyone was lucky. The door shopped. A shop door bell rang, causing him to sit down and turn around to see two unfamiliar men in black uniforms, black shirts. Can I help you, gentlemen? He asked politely, trying his best to not stammer. The men ignored him, and with one lazily picking up his mug of tea and taking it a satisfied gulp, the silver instinctive uh, surge of anger put that before he could react. The other black shirt grabbed him by the collar and slammed him into the counter face first, causing him to taste blood. He wreathed, but the other man's grip was iron. He heard the sound of his mug being flung against the ground and shattered. Tell you what, mate, I think I think you can. He heard the first black shirt say in a smug voice, There's a girl who comes through here in the morning. Some of the boys say she took care of the traitor rats when they held this place. Is that true? Maisie, he thought. Ted's girl. I'm sorry, I don't. It was cut off by a baton to the head, causing him to near, nearly see stars. I don't know, I don't know, he cried, whipping. He felt himself being let go and collapsed to the ground in a heap. You says, guy, said the other man. And with that, they left, leaving Graham alone, clutching his bleeding nose and weeping. All he wanted was for things to go back to the way they were. Damnatio memoye. We are not the first fashion to rule Britain's sculptured. Sceptered shores, yet what dominates the memory of the past? Failure. L Lord Bedford, A.K. Justin, Barry Donville, all of them failed. Two years they had in power, twenty years to bring the fascism to Britain like they promised, and what did we receive? Nothing. Under the negligent watch, we have had no less than two Judeo Bolshevik uprisings that almost toppled our new order, and many voices within our government cry out for total obliteration to wipe the slate clean and start anew with a fresh fascist history. Others, however, urge caution and suggest a lighter hand, no matter which cause he did. A long overdue reckoning is about to commence, and our very past shall be as clay in our hands. Lessons in obedience. 
He's here, sir, said the secretary nervously. The man was afraid, Fontaine noted. Good. If Hammond had inspired so much fear by re reputation alone, then his men would have done likewise in the task he set them. Send him in, commanded the Prime Minister, before turning to face the window with his arms folded behind his back. A moment later, Geoffrey Hamm entered, his secretary hastily moving out of the man's way. As done, sir, they'll do as they're told. A few of them were louder than others, so we made examples. Fontaine smirked as he listened, looking out at all the figures milling about in the streets below. Bureaucrats, civil servants, and MPs likes, also being used to being insulated. Amusing how easily that illusion could be shattered by one man with a truncheon, he cleared a sword and turned away from the window. How many demonstrations did you need? We'll need to draw up replacement of candidates and soon. Three, answered Ham. The rest understood the message after that, some res resignations, but most accepted. They lost any wing to the cow, cow runner, and they know better than, de than to go to the police. Three, more than expected, but old stupid toads like the kind of the old guard collected had always been stubborn. Still, three less voices in the commons with a message even a blind idiot could have missed, so you see that investigations are closed quickly. If anyone from the police complains, have your men deal with it, but softly. Persuasion first. Ham bowed his head in acknowledgement before continuing. The lords, not yet, Fountain interrupted. We can't touch Walp's people there yet, and the last thing we need to do is him going to the Visa Maya to whine or Germanio questioning our judgment. <sighs> Fret not, their day is coming, and soon I will have something of an alternative solution in mind there. The lords would need a lighter touch than Ham. See you up on the forges. Uh, yes, the tide of history has turned in our favor. The Black Church, once perceived as an upstart radicals, are now an integral part of the Britain's security services. A key part in a new order, replacing Jordan's vile pack of criminals. Lord's Portsmouth, and the rest of his pamper and potent followers are left powerless, and we have handled the legacy of our predecessors. We shall cement our control of the party and the nation with the deployment of Black Church contingents all over Britain in key locations, ensuring that we are able to strike anywhere we require. No Britain will be free of our protection, and no dissident will be free of our eternal watch. The fear of the past. I started, it had to be said sooner or later. Bedford, Lord George, and Donville have left the nation as a wreck, and as I look at it, Britain is unrepairable. The room turned silent, with all eyes on Ham, exactly what he wanted by making such a comment. Fontaine would rest his hand on, against his hand against Ham. The song and dance would happen too often for his liking, being pricked up at Ham's comment when nobody else would. I would be very careful about just about shouting such a statement around. They're nothing like what we have fought against in the uprising. None of them are outright socialists like many of the regional leaders in the urban areas were. They were just misinformed and led by the wrong influences like uh, Be Beckett and Wallop. Ham laughed humorously at a bitter smirk on his face. Yes, and you would surely know a thing or two about being an outright socialist, wouldn't you? Being bit his tongue, such comments from Ham were the norm, unfortunately. The men who led us in the past were not who we needed to lead a nation, Ham continued. That is why we had several rebellions against the government under their leadership. Eyes in the room all closed in on Bean, who took a deep breath. The Judeo-Bolshevik and capitalistic mentality was going to form within the resistance no matter what. It would not matter if the American infiltrators were not there or not to influence them, there would be heavy resistance against the fascist Britain. Most of the major figures of such a resistance have been executed or prosecuted, and now we can truly enforce our vision, something no previous leader of the British People's Party ever really had. I'm unsure you understand the situation, John, that will lead to failure. Who would want to remember the failures of Britain when we are truly a perfect people? No would want to that if they understood the British people, which they clearly never did. They should completely obliterate it from history, no exception. Their leadership should be a mere footnote in history that can only be the pompous academics we care about. Unfortunately for our forefathers here, they must be left behind. We're here to make change, and why remember people who halted such? Such an inflammatory statement shall be used only behind the closed doors of your mind, Ham. Fascist popularity. A uh, tower of fire. Uh, fire rages. Where once the stagnant rot of the old order dominated Britannia's fierce shores, now gleaming, now the gleaming light of the fascist revolution burns fiercely over a sculptured isle. The thinning tramp of the black shirts echo from Sutherland to Kent, enshrining a single will, a single power over Britannia. The fascist revolution has triumphed. Yet within London's halls, the conflict grows. Factionalism has long been a problem within the British People's Party. Yet now the infighting continued on with in her purified ranks, coalescing. Uh, uh, around two figures, Jeffrey Hamm and John Bean, a great leader, cannot have two right hands. One must rise, the other must fall. Now the question is, who? Phantoms. After the Battle of Cable Street 30 years ago, many Britons hoped that the days of the Black Boot marching across their streets were to be nothing more than the distant memories of an uncertain age. Such hopes were ripped asunder by the horrors of the war and what came afterwards as fascism seized power, of course. Yet until recently, the BFC uh, had overshadowed the old companion as a monster under the bed to look out for, but with the coming of Fountain, it seemed that the black shirts have begun to retake the streets that they once terrorized. Their perversive gaze oversees everything. Their boots can perpetually be heard marching through alleyways, or engaged in constant brawls and street fights, intent on crushing the last two sparks of resistance. Their terror is not limited to the old British cities. Across the fields of the old countryside, Roman gangs and black shirts terrorize small villages and towns suspected of harboring Himmler remnants. One man is pleased with his terror. Jeffrey Ham looked upon his minions' doings and found himself happy with them. Mosley would be proud of his most faithful acolyte, transforming the black shirts from a gang of thugs into the arm of the BBP, with an achievement many could only ever dream of doing, and he had made it a reality. That being complained all he wanted, for there was precious little he could do to stop them. Tomorrow belongs to me. Uh, 
I think our goal is to build as many roads as possible because that barely helps, but a tiny bit helps the economy and the growing. Yeah. From powered states, a lot of infrastructure, so all in all consuming flame. Peace. A word that Great Britain had forgotten ever since the first German boot set her foot on her shores. The squirming, corrupting insurgency that once threatened to crush the new order in Britain had lived beneath a broken government's heel. The British People's Party stands victorious, united under the leadership of Andrew Fontaine, a man seemingly ready for anything, and yet if one were to look below the surface, they would see a storm brewing. To the rest of the world, the BPP may seem united, but beneath the surface, the war between John Bean and Geoffrey Hamm was growing in intensity, spreading it and consuming all. From the lowly activists marching through London streets to the cabinet itself, an air of rage fells the nation, he, the wind of conflict rages. As Sam mar uh, marches under the banners of Mosley, Bolton Circle, he preaches a classical aberration of serving Fountain, the great leader, and there are times that Fountain marches with him, serving as a knight of Arthur Arthurian legend that Ham so desires him to be, yet sometimes Fountain, and says preaches of the collective, of the nation, and the syndicates working together to propel it forward, and behind him John Bean smiles in the shadows. There's a singular constant of British politics, violence, and as a wind of hatred blows across isles, the world looks for what they're vain, and finds one in Fountain. Huh. Hatred? Fascism's not hatred. What? Andrew Fountain used to pray for moments like these, a nation broken, dejected and traumatized, given a hero to, uh, to deliver it. The opportunity to step in and show the British people and indeed the entire world what a truly modern example of fascism could look like. For a decade, this nation was merely just a fantasy to Fountain, a man stuck in his mind in a country where many thought a nation engulfed by fascism could not be rebirthed into another stage of the ideology. Merely shambling along with from one stagnated line of thought to another, the uprising proved these people wrong, however. The final piece needed for the decades-long puzzle Fountain had been trying to solve was placed in his back pocket. All he needed to do was place it into its slot. The year is 1965, and Fountain steers the path of Britain's future. Her destination seems so obvious and yet so obscured, with all that can be certain is that Fountain will follow his dreams to the very end, no matter what, wherever that, lead that leads Britain is anyone's guess. But that is the end, currently, for Andrew Fountain's content in good old TNO. Um, so we have this uh, national spirit. We got Metro Syria, divided helmsman, of course. And I got Thuggish Hegemony. It is what it is. But that's pretty much it for us for now. Can't wait to. Uh, he has actually more content, but I think that's going to wrap it up for us here. If you've enjoyed Andrew Fontaine, please consider leaving a like, subscribe if you're new, check out my Discord link in the description below, and I'll see you tomorrow in another campaign. Thanks for watching. Have a tremendous rest of your day.